When a game console ages, our perception of its cultural impact tends to suffer from recency bias. We remember its midlife, its final few years, because that's when we were having the most fun with it, that's when it was the most successful. What often gets misremembered, or straight up forgotten, is how consoles launch. The 3DS is a buckwild video game console. Sure, now, in the year 2019, it's widely regarded as a universal success, it dominated the handheld market for close to a decade, got classic game after classic game, and it received countless hardware revisions such as the XL, the new 3DS, the new 3DS XL, and the hilariously ugly 2DS. But if you hadn't hopped on the bandwagon when it launched in early 2011, you probably forgot that for nearly an entire year, the 3DS was flopping hard. Like, it was bad. Lots of reasons for this. Uh, the major early titles were either N64 remakes or low profile series like Nintendogs or Pilot Wings. The first year was so lacking in games, I still have the launch day port of Street Fighter 4 as my most played title. The 3DS eShop didn't even launch until five months in. But I mean, lots of consoles have weak software lineups. This is not exclusive to the 3DS. See, the thing that really hurt the 3DS was its price point. At 250 US, this thing cost almost as much as the Wii at its launch, and that was a home console. But even worse than that, it cost just as much as its direct competitor, the PlayStation Vita, which was basically more powerful in every way that was quantifiable. And it even had a more expensive 3G model. You have to understand, back then, people thought of the Vita as like a portable PS3 with a data plan. The 3DS bombed so hard in the first six months that Nintendo cut the price by nearly 30%, even though they had already been selling the console at a loss. And because of that, they ended up offering early adopters 20 free retro games as an apology. Just the idea of a huge company like Nintendo telling its customers, we goofed up, it seemed like an embarrassment that they'd never come back from. Which is why it's so buck wild to think that the 3DS swung back so hard that as of 2019, compared to the Vita's lifetime sales of 16 million units, the 3DS has sold 70 million units. Even with the Switch out as a much more powerful portable console, Nintendo is still making games for the 3DS, whereas Sony hasn't even mentioned the Vita in a press conference since about 2015, leaving it to become the dumping ground for niche Japanese visual novels. So yeah, talk about an underdog story. But that underdog story becomes even more remarkable when you factor in the handheld's main selling point and the absolute media shitstorm it generated. Glasses Free 3D was such a weird, wacky, and ballsy marketing gimmick for a system. First of all, let me say this. No video game manufacturer will ever top this name. It's immediately clear that it's the sequel to an existing brand. It's also immediately clear what the big flagship feature is, and it's a genius pun. Works on all the levels. I'm not taking questions. Don't, don't talk to me, don't at me. So despite the great name, as a selling point, Glasses Free 3D, did raise some concerns in people's minds. People had questions. Uh, some of them were the following. Are you sure you want to do 3D again? Um, cause last time you tried this, you invented a monochromatic motion sickness machine that got scrapped after uh, 20 games. Number two, how will this affect system performance? Aren't you rendering two images simultaneously? Frame rate and battery life are likely to take a hit. And last, but also most critically, number three. Will this fuck up my children's eyes? Like I said, if you weren't following the lead up to the 3DS launch day like a uh, 13-year-old me who still believed in the concept of brand loyalty, you probably weren't aware of the hysteria being whipped up by articles like these. These are some spicy headlines. Nintendo 3DS could harm children's sight, parents warned. Destroyer of eyes, who knew 3D could be so risky? The Nintendo 3DS will destroy children's eyeballs, brackets, no, comma, really. Early coverage of the system at trade shows like E3 even had some adults concerned. Eye fatigue and slight dizziness was noticed in play sessions as short as a few minutes. 3D movies aren't exactly free of their own issues, but historically they've never been this severe. So is this just pre-release hardware that was gonna get fixed, or was this just the Virtual Boy all over again? Was this gonna cause rampant motion sickness and literal headaches? Well, you don't typically sell 70 million units of a device that melts your customer's eyes, so clearly it wasn't that bad. I've played hundreds of hours on mine, and my corneas aren't missing. Maybe it was just another in a long line of controversies that arose out of ignorant paranoia. Like that time the Hobbit movies were releasing at 48 frames per second instead of the usual 24, and people thought they should boycott the movie because of that. This is a thing that happened less than 10 years ago. The thing is, I'm not so sure it's just paranoia in this case. It's been widely reported in the past eight years that a lot of people who use the 3DS play with it off because it causes them mild discomfort. So the question isn't a matter of which of these two statements are correct, but more so where exactly in between these two statements the truth lies. 
I want to answer one very specific question in this video. How does glasses-free 3D differ from 3D with glasses? So to answer that, let's talk about how our eyes work. Assuming you're watching this video with two eyes, and my condolences, if not, let's do a little experiment. You've most likely done this experiment before, either because you were shown in science class or you've done it without even realizing it. Hold up a finger in front of your face, right up close to your eyes. Now look at it with only one eye open. Now close that eye and open the other eye. Notice how your viewing angle changes. Your choice of eye will affect the perceived horizontal position of your finger because, well, at least horizontally, your eyes are in two different physical locations. Your left eye is naturally going to see a slightly different image than your right eye. Now I want you to repeat this experiment, but with an object far off in the distance, maybe like a tree or a tall building. Not as much of a difference, huh? It doesn't move nearly as much between both eyes. Compared to your finger, it doesn't shift as much horizontally. If the distance to an object is comparable in size to the separation between your eyes, then you'll see a noticeable shift. But if the object is many, many times further away than the distance between your eyes, then you won't see a shift. This effect is called parallax. It's when your brain compares the difference between what each eye sees so it can make judgments on depth of field. The end result is one combined image that we call stereoscopic vision. Stereo meaning two. We also sometimes call this binocular vision, where the bi also means two. Now parallax isn't the only way humans can judge depth. Even with only one eye, you can always tell when one object is in front of the other. Relative sizes is also a big clue. I know from, you know, being a human, that an apple is much, much smaller than a bus. So if an apple appears to be about the same size as a bus, I know the apple is very close to me, whereas the bus is far away from me. That being said, I wouldn't recommend playing baseball with an eye patch anytime soon. Stereoscopic vision works because the environment we live in is actually three-dimensional. There's an x-axis, a y-axis, and a z-axis. Whereas a photograph or a movie of a 3D environment, those are just two-dimensional recreations of three-dimensional space. But, and here's the kicker, if you have a pair of two-dimensional images, each taken at a slightly different angle than the other, you can trick your brain into thinking that they make up a single 3D image. The tricky part is figuring out how to send image A to your left eye and image B to your right eye without them mixing. If you know exactly where your viewer's head will be, like say, directly strapped to a big fancy headset, then you can just carefully design sets of mirrors and lenses to project the two images into the corresponding eyes. Oh, okay, that's easy. Okay, maybe easy isn't the proper word to use here. Straightforward, maybe, is a better word. If you do a little math, you'll get it to work out. You'll get it working. The earliest 3D technologies were called stereograms, and they go as far back as the late 1800s. Funnily enough, it's almost like we came full circle. VR systems today have pretty much the same setup, just with more electronics. Let's assume, though, that you don't actually know where your viewer's head is going to be. Let's say that you're in a movie theater, which is a very, very large area, lots of seats, lots of people, and all of the people need to see the 3D effect. No amount of lenses and mirrors will be enough to make the effect work for every single person, so we need a new strategy. So what you do is you layer image A and image B on the same projector screen, and you provide each viewer with a pair of filtering glasses. One way to do this is to color encode the images as red and cyan, with the glasses only letting one of the two colors pass. The color saturation is pretty ugly, and it doesn't look that great, but hey, it was cheap, it worked, it was a novelty, it was the 1950s. Now, although we associate the iconic red and cyan glasses with 3D movies, they actually weren't used in theaters for very long, instead being ideal for television and comic books. We quickly transitioned to using polarized light, with one lens oriented vertically and the other horizontally. Polarization is still the dominant tech used today, although they've gotten smarter about how they pull it off. They actually use clockwise and counterclockwise polarization, which allows you to tilt your head without ruining the effect. Some modern systems just do a much more precise form of color filtering, letting in ever so slightly different shades of red, green, and blue to each eye. All those expensive 3D TV sets use an entirely different method though. Batteries in the glasses alternate between shutting each lens on and off in sync with what's shown on the TV. So at a given time, you're only ever seeing image A or image B, but the shutters in your glasses are so fast that the human eye can't register that so it seems like you're seeing one coherent image. All of this is to say you can design a 3D system with glasses in a million different ways. But if you're making a personalized handheld system, you've got way more interesting options at your disposal. 
Auto stereoscopy is based on the assumption that the user will be keeping their head, and therefore their eyes, in a relatively small range. We call this range the sweet spot. Since we know where each eye will be down to a range of a few inches, two unique images can be projected directly towards their respective eyes, but without the need for fancy headgear like with a VR system. This technique is perfect for handheld devices like the 3DS because the user can make adjustments without affecting other viewers because there are no other viewers. Although auto stereoscopy may have been popularized by Nintendo with the 3DS, they certainly weren't the inventors of the concept. The first functional prototype of an auto stereoscopic system dates back to Frederick E. Ives in 1901, and theoretical work by Auguste Berthier existed even earlier. Their techniques were based on the idea of interlacing the two images, represented as red and blue here, and using a very fine mesh barrier to precisely block light depending on which eye you want to send the image to. You know those neat 3D postcards, or in my case a notebook? They're technically a form of auto stereoscopy, just a very primitive version of it that instead of using a very fine mesh, they use super tiny curved lenses so that you see one of the two images depending on the angle you hold the postcard. The first modern implementation of glasses-free 3D was in a pair of laptops developed by Japanese tech giant Sharp in the early 2000s. They called the technology a parallax barrier. And wouldn't you know it, the tech used in the 3DS screen is produced by Sharp. The upper screen of the 3DS has a resolution of 800 pixels by 240 pixels. In 2D mode, the horizontal resolution makes use of all 800 pixels, but turning on the 3D slider splits that resolution in half. 400 pixels for each eye. Now each vertical column of pixels alternates between image A and image B. If this was all there was to it, the only thing you'd see is a blurry 2D image, because both eyes are seeing image A and image B spliced together. The piece that ties it all together is the parallax barrier. Have you ever stared at a fence like this one before? If you stare straight at it, you can't see through to the other side. But if you close one eye, suddenly you can see behind half of the slats. Now if you switch eyes, you can suddenly see behind the other half of the slats. The parallax barrier essentially recreates this fence design, but it does so using voltage-controlled liquid crystals. You don't need to know what that means. Basically, there's crystals in liquid. The voltage can spin them around. If you spin them in a certain way, you make a fence. This is a liquid crystal fence, that's all I'm saying. The 3D slider switches on, and bam, fence is there. This diagram right here is the clearest way to visualize what's happening. Now the actual process involves way, way, way more pixels, but trust me, the math works out. Your left eye is only seeing one image, your right eye is only seeing the other image. And remember, the math only works out if your head is in a very specific spot. If you're too close, too far away, or you're viewing it at too sharp an angle, the effect breaks down and you're left looking at a pair of blurry images. So I think we found the answer to our question. Glasses-free 3D isn't fundamentally different from 3D with glasses. Really, you're using a filter to selectively view a pair of slightly different images. It just depends whether the filter is a pair of glasses or hidden behind a fancy screen. Now we're left with a bit of a mystery. If there is no fundamental difference between this and this, why all the hysteria? Surely these headlines are wrong then. Before you start sharpening your pitchforks, let's establish some context. The 3DS launched in the February to March window of 2011. The 3DS was revealed at E3 the previous year, June 2010. If you follow the media coverage of the system from its reveal up until its launch, you'll notice an interesting trend. The majority of articles reporting on the potential health risk of the 3DS didn't start popping up until December of 2010, a full six months after the reveal. It's kind of weird, right? You'd think that this was because Nintendo had yet to make any sort of comment on the health risks at E3, but that's not actually true. Here's a quote from then Nintendo president Reggie fils -Aimé. We will recommend that very young children not look at 3D images. That's because, young children, the muscles for the eyes are not fully formed. This is the same messaging that the industry is putting out with 3D movies. So it is a standard protocol. We have the same type of messaging for the Virtual Boy as an example. Reggie also specified that the recommended cutoff age would be around 7. The thing is, this was an off-the-cuff response taken from a live interview at a time when the 3DS hardware was likely still in development. So although that quote got some media coverage, it was nothing compared to what followed the official health and safety warning posted on Nintendo's Japanese site in December of 2010. This is paraphrased from a Google translation. Symptoms such as tiredness and discomfort can occur when using conventional game consoles for extended periods of time, and 3D images may cause these symptoms to appear sooner. We recommend breaks approximately every 30 minutes. 
The vision of small children under six years old is said to be in the development state, and specialists indicate the Nintendo 3DS, in addition to 3D movies and 3D TV, can affect the growth of small children's eyes. The statement goes on to mention the built-in parental controls which can disable the 3D mode using a password system. This was a clear line in the sand. Affect the growth of small children's eyes. That is an escalation of the language used at E3. And the system is launching in less than two months at this point, like the hardware is finished being developed. There are no more changes being made. This official corporate statement raised some eyebrows. It should be noted that earlier that same year, Sony, in June, had issued a similar warning about its glasses-based 3D games, and Panasonic did the same for their 3D TVs that same year as well. One Sony spokesman said, The company has no medical evidence of any negative effects from 3D. He said Sony issued the warning because children's bodies can be sensitive. The reason the 3DS received so much more scrutiny was because it was glasses-free. Back then, this sounded like a gimmick that was too good to be true. Obviously, now, like, you, the viewer, kind of know that's not true, but back then it sounded like a reasonable concern. Nintendo's brand is so closely associated with children that an official statement saying, hey, don't let your kids use the selling point of our system. Don't let them use it. Don't touch it. Don't. Don't do it. That looked like a red flag. Now get ready for the best part of this whole weird, confusing saga. Nintendo's biggest defenders were not its fanboys. It was the American Academy of Ophthalmology. The world's largest association of eye doctors and surgeons, with more than 29,000 members globally, says there are no conclusive studies to date on the short or long-term effects of 3D digital products in children's visual development. Nor are there persuasive conclusive theories on how 3D digital products could cause damage in children with healthy eyes, it adds. However, the AAO says children with eye conditions such as amblyopia, an imbalance in the strength of vision between two eyes, and strabismus, misaligned eyes, would have difficulty seeing 3D images and would be more likely to experience headaches and or eye fatigue. Here's the thing about that last bit though. It wasn't a warning for kids under 6 to avoid the 3DS. In fact, it was the opposite. If a child can't see the 3D effect on the 3DS, or they experience eye fatigue or dizziness, it may indicate an undiagnosed disorder. Because children often don't receive full eye checkups before the age of 6, the 3DS could be critical in catching eye problems early. Implications of viewing games in 3D for children under the age of 7 are difficult to determine. However, the new 3DS handheld game might help in identifying children requiring vision care, including those under the age of 7, by isolating binocular vision problems which are not identified easily with standard eye charts. In particular, many of these disorders are easy to fix when found at a young age, but much harder to fix at an age like, say, 12. Basically, assuming it was used in moderation, eye doctors saw no problem with children under 6 using the 3DS, even if just as a diagnostic tool. What might the danger be for a child, a young child, first off, under six, yeah. if, you, if they do use it? The challenge under six is that these aren't the kids that actually will tell you when they're having troubles with their eyes. So if they're really having nausea, fatigue, um, double vision, troubles with their eyes, they're probably not going to tell you, especially on top of the fact that their parents probably will take away their toy. What's interesting is that this isn't limited to children. Many adults have undiagnosed visual impairments, but aren't aware of this fact because they don't impact normal vision. Rather, these mild disorders make 3D unpleasant to watch or cause a breakdown of the effect entirely. This is usually because one eye has to work harder than the other to stay focused on the illusion, leading to discomfort over long viewing periods. Hello, uh, slightly future Kevin speaking here. A couple months after recording my initial script for this video, I was asking people on Twitter about their experiences with the new 3DS, which was the major hardware revision that released a few years into the console's life cycle. It introduced several features, but one of the biggest was eye tracking for the 3D effect, meaning you could tilt the handheld from side to side and still maintain the effect. In particular, I had a really interesting conversation where someone mentioned that the eye tracking made it possible for them to see the 3D effect, whereas on the original version of the handheld, they couldn't see the 3D effect at all. This was due to poor binocular vision, meaning one of their eyes had to work a lot harder to maintain the illusion. Obviously, this is anecdotal and not 100% universal, but quite frankly, that's a huge deal for accessibility, and it demonstrates how some features that a lot of us may view as frivolous are actually essential to some people to enjoy the full experience. Okay, cool. Uh, back to the original script. When asked about the age rating of six years old, the consensus among experts is that it's not so much based on any medical data 
as it is a legal buffer aid to protect Nintendo and others from liability. This seems like the most likely explanation given that Sony has the same age warning. Most children fully develop binocular vision by age 3, so double that age and that's a pretty decent buffer. Really makes you wonder about the truth behind these headlines, huh? The body of the articles provide much more balanced takes on the situation. This Tech Radar article, 3DS might permanently damage children's eyes, features this line. British eye specialist warns that Nintendo 3DS could permanently damage young children's eyes. But reading the whole article reveals the full context of that warning. There is a gray area surrounding the potential eye health issues caused by 3D. This is concerning all age groups, not just under 6 years old. Our own professional body, the General Optical Council, cannot issue clinical guidance for 3D eyewear until the release of prescription 3D eyewear, which is due later this year. A similar situation happened with this Fox News article. The headline is 3D games can ruin children's eyes, Nintendo warns, but they later go on to quote an optometrist whose main takeaway is, I don't foresee it as a major issue. Nintendo is just being overly concerned. This PC World article was great. It provided the best in-depth interview on the subject, and it's with optometrist Nathan Vanilla Warford. Critically, he says the following. All of the different 3D techniques are essentially achieving the same goals through different means. Every 3D technology at its core is presenting each eye with different images. In the case of artificial 3D, the way the eyes coordinate, align, and focus in everyday life are different compared to the real world. So if you didn't believe me earlier, this was a licensed professional confirming that glasses-free 3D isn't any worse for you than 3D with glasses. But there is a catch. The Nintendo 3DS system is different than 3D TVs and 3D films. The closer you hold or view the 3D system, the more strain it will put on the convergence and focusing system of the eyes. This applies to both 2D and 3D images. Therefore, the strain of watching a 3D TV, which is ideally 10 feet away, or 3D films, which are much further away, is less intense for the eye systems. It is in this way the Nintendo 3DS is inherently less safe and more likely to cause 3D symptoms like fatigue, nausea, headaches, dizziness, and eye strain. The reason people experience eye fatigue and dizziness much more quickly with a 3DS compared to other media is not because of its glasses-free nature. It's due to how close to your eyes you hold the system, and this applies to both 3D and 2D. The minimum recommended distance to avoid eye strain, whether it be with a phone, game system, or even a book, is called the Harman distance, and is approximately the distance from your eye to your elbow. Additionally, many optometrists recommend the 20-20-20 rule. Take a 20 second break every 20 minutes to look at something 20 feet away. And this lines up with Nintendo's recommendations as well. Basically, we stare at a lot of screens throughout the day. If we're gonna keep doing that, whether it's 2D or 3D, the least we can do for the sake of our poor eyes is get better at taking breaks. The 3DS has a strange legacy. Beloved in spite of the fact that most players couldn't care less about the feature that gave it its name. So much so that the 2DS launched barely two years after the original system, removing any incentive for developers to create games that truly took advantage of the 3D feature. Like yeah, it looked rad, but there are at most maybe two games I can make a case for that needed 3D to fully enjoy. It wasn't intrusive and obnoxious like the Wii's motion controls were, and it wasn't criminally underutilized like the Wii U gamepad. As far as hardware gimmicks go, I don't miss it, but I think it earned its place in the history of neat gimmicks. Hopefully you learned something, and thanks for watching.